Good evening, saints of the living God. Uh, this is Pastor Barnes, Senior Pastor of the Mount Olive Baptist Church, um, welcoming you um, to our Bible study on tonight. Um, I'm standing in the gap for my dear sister, Dr. Margaret uh, Edney, uh, who is not feeling her best, so I pray that uh, we as saints of God will send up uh, prayers on her behalf along with her husband, uh, Deacon uh, Edney. Um, it's so good to be um, in your presence once again, and I pray that God has been uh, gracious to you on today, and I, I just pray uh, that you are, are having a blessed day uh, in the Lord uh, as we come to uh, uh, gird ourselves, uh, as we come to equip ourselves uh, with the Word of God, I pray that you are in the right frame of mind. I pray that there are no distractions. And I pray that you will just get on the phone even before we start and call somebody and, and let them know that we're having a Bible study, that we're having Bible Word here at uh, Mount Olive Baptist Church. Um, if you don't mind, can we just say a, a brief prayer uh, before we have Bible study. Most gracious Father, we, we thank you once again for allowing us to come into your holy presence. And we don't take coming into your presence lightly. Uh, Father, we pray that you will give us the, the mind, the wisdom uh, as we dissect your word on tonight, that it might be applied daily to our lives so that we might be a living example of you. Uh, for we realize, Father, that we were made in your image, Lord God. So, so let us continue to live the life and the purpose that you have called us to be. We thank you for being with us. Uh, we pray that you will extend your power from on high, uh, that we can understand and apply your word uh, to our everyday living. We thank you in advance for this awesome study. I pray uh, that you would just touch my dear sister, Dr. Edney, Lord God. I pray that you would heal her to the fullest, Lord God, because we know that with you all things are possible and all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And we know she loves you, Lord God. Bless all, heal all uh, who are watching uh, tonight emotionally, spiritually, Lord God, and physically. We give you glory. We give you honor. Uh, in Christ's name, we do pray. Amen. I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. And and uh, we want to uh, talk about uh, salt and light, uh, a very uh, common term uh, in the sense uh, of everyday living. Uh, but we know that Jesus talked about salt and he talked about light many times in the Bible. And he had a preachment from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which was found in uh, the Gospel according to Matthew uh, chapter 5, where he uh, expounded on the Beatitudes uh, in life. And uh, we want to look at Matthew chapter 5. And I pray that you have your two, uh, your sword with you. Amen. I don't want you to just take my word. Uh, I need you to see it for yourself. Uh, we know that faith comes by hearing and, and hearing the word of God. But I not only want you to hear it, I want you to see the word of God as it's being exposed uh, for your fulfillment and your uh, joy. So if you will turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 5, um, we want to begin at, at verse uh, 3, um, and we'll just read until the Lord tells me to stop. That okay? <laughs> amen, amen. Um, Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Excuse me. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. 
Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven uh, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now let's look at uh, uh, verse 13 where we're going to uh, focus on tonight. Uh, talking about the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Somebody say amen. Amen. We want to talk tonight about the, the subjects of the kingdom. Uh, we want to talk about the distinctiveness of the disciples. Uh, the disciples uh, which are you. Uh, you are Christ's disciples. Uh, and as disciples, uh, you, you are citizen of a kingdom. Uh, you are citizen of a kingdom of Christ. And if you are disciples being a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, uh, we must have positive influence. Amen. Um, here in the Beatitudes, we know that Jesus' uh, focus uh, in the Beatitudes was primarily on interior, uh, personal uh, characteristics such as dependency, uh, uh, meekness, uh, yearning for righteousness, uh, mercifulness uh, and purity, authenticity as well. And, and, and we need to understand that those things I just mentioned, those, those personal traits or these personal traits, they are private, but yet they have public uh, implications. Uh, what are you saying? Uh, those who are displaying uh, such characters will be noticeable. If, if we display those characters I just mentioned, uh, they must be noticeable. And, and, and in order for them to be noticeable, you can't be in isolation as a Christian or as a child of God. In order for those traits to be noticeable, you got to get out amongst the world. Amen. You can't be living in fear or not letting the characteristic that Christ has put in you uh, be shown. Okay. So, so, so being that it might be a, a, a private, but yet have public implications uh, here uh, in this matter of the text, Jesus shift the emphasis to the external. Okay, that means that we are public characteristics of his citizens to his kingdom. Amen. So, so the poetic nature of this sermon here that Jesus was preaching is, is clearly evident. His statements are very plain, very simple, that even a child can understand, that even a child can follow. Uh, he says, you are the salt of the earth. And in verse 16 or 15, you are the, the light of the world. Amen. And obviously, they are metaphorically expressions which are designed to highlight uh, what I like to call a comparison. As Christ's children, we are always compared to something. We are compared to somebody. We are compared to things in this world. But if you want to compare yourself to somebody, you need to be compared to the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Okay? Because subjects of the kingdom, which we are, are in some ways, we are like salt. And we are like uh, 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 like light. Amen, somebody? And those who are not salty, come on, those who are not salty, I'm not talking about hating, I'm talking about salt, 
salty is being salt for the world. So those who are, are not salty and those who, who lights do not shine forth uh, in the world, uh, you are failing to live up to divine expectations. Because your divine expectation is to be salt and light for this carnal world. Amen. So what am I saying by divine expectation? You got to understand by being a child of God, there are some expectations for those who are called by God. And they are divine. You need to understand that the calling of God carries uh, our privileges and it carries blessings. But the call of God have responsibilities. So if you're going to be called by God, God is going to give you some divine responsibilities. And you must carry out those divine responsibilities. But if you're not carrying out the divine responsibilities, then you need to check yourself. You need to take a look in the mirror and see, are you really a child of God? He says, you, ye, you are the salt. What? of the earth. And this passage, you are the salt of the earth, serves as a warning to flavorless and unnoticeable believers. Yes, we have some flavorless and unnoticeable unnoticeable believers. Okay? So the what so you might be saying, well, what is the significance of salt? If I were to ask you what were the significance of salt that we use every day what will your answer be? Have you really ever thought about it? You know, I know people that don't use too much salt on this. Salt will give you high blood pressure, which is true. But salt has some benefits as well, amen? Because it's a preservative. And what I'm saying is salt can delay or uh, decay, decays, and it can help retard uh, deterioration, deterioration, amen. I know as a young man growing up in Southampton County, uh, you know what I'm saying, you know, my, my, my people were fortunate enough to own their own pigs and, and, and hogs. And every winter we would kill them, you know what I'm saying, to make ham, bacon, sausages, uh, cracklings, or whatever we, we had. By not having the proper refrigeration, we would put salt over the hams and stuff to preserve them. Amen. Okay. So so salt is like an antiseptic to me. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Because without refrigeration, salting down food products was the best way, like I said earlier, to preserve them. The preservative quality of salt is likely Jesus' primary idea in our discussion for the night. Also, salt is a flavor enhancer. Salt adds flavor. And other ideas associated with salt, um, when it comes to the biblical perspective, uh, in the Old Testament, the rabbis apparently use salt as a symbol of, of uh, wisdom. Uh, they use it as a symbol of whiteness, uh, of pungency, uh, as a thirst producing product. Uh, even in the Old Testament, Old Testament meat offering was always to be seasoned with the salt of the covenant. Amen? Let me take you there. I, I want to show you. Amen? Let us go to Leviticus uh, chapter 2. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 2. Amen. Leviticus chapter 2, we want to look at verse 13. I'm going to bring you up to speed, amen. Uh, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt. Neither shall thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thy offering, Thou shall offer salt. Thou shall offer salt. So that lets me know that salt was a very, very important part of the offering because number one, it spoke of purity. It spoke of a uh, 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 preservation, and uh, and it spoke of expense. And 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 in this text I just read, every sacrifice offered to God had to be pure, it had to be uh, enduring, 
and it should cost something. Amen. Uh, in this one verse, Leviticus 2.13, God repeated the command three times. Not only that, amen, Saul also spoke of friendship. Because even in Old Testament, according to, to ancient custom, a bond of friendship was established through the eating of salt. It was said that once uh, you had eaten a, a, another man's salt, you were his friend for life. And God wanted every sacrifice uh, here to be a reminder of his relationship. The very fact that God commanded that every grain offering should include just a pinch of of salt shows that small things matter in our service to God. Our faithfulness uh, in small things, guess what? It honors God. Your faithfulness in small things honor God. Just a pinch of faithfulness, guess what? It honor God. And with all your offerings, you shall offer salt. That's what the word says. In all of your offerings, you shall offer salt. Jesus spoke of the ideal Excuse me. Jesus spoke of the idea of salt and sacrifice uh, in the in the gospel according to Mark. Amen. Don't know specifically where it is at this time, uh, uh, but I know he spoke about it in the gospel according to Mark. Uh, he said that people uh, as living sacrifices to God must be seasoned with fire and with salt. Amen. Because salt spoke of many things. It spoke about the covenant. It, sp it speaks about fellowship. It speaks about sincerity, uh, uh, purity. And the, the inclusion of salt with all of your offering, which Levitical told, uh, uh, tells us, speaks to the way we should serve God. So I, I want you to note tonight, we are in service not to ourselves, but we are in service to the high most God. So in all of our service, we must remember the covenant God made with us. Amen? In all of our service, we must remember the fellowship with God and with one another. Amen? And in our service, we must remember the sincerity of why we are serving. And in our service, we must operate in purity. Okay? Now let's talk about comparison. Man and salt. Salt has an influence upon preservation. Salt preserves. So the comparison is that as citizens of the kingdom or as children of the Most High God, we should have an influence on this world. Amen? Like salt, as children of the Most High God, we, we must suppress and we must halt moral decay. Amen? And we should enhance the flavor of our society. That's including your home or your job. Uh, when you go out into the market, uh, when you come to the church, or uh, within your community. Because the, the presence of believers should restrain or help restrain evil in this world. And God knows we got a lot of evil in this world. And it, it ponders the question, are we really being the salt that God is calling us to be? Okay? Okay. We, we, we need to understand that this world tends toward decomposition and this world is actually rotting away. When the world is left to itself, it festers. Amen? It festers for the germs of evil. Why? Because evil is everywhere. Is present and is active. Amen. We we live in a world that constantly tends toward toward decay. Some of the Christless structures of the world in our eyes may look okay, but that's why we walk by faith and not by sight. 
the structure of the world might look okay, but inside this world is rotting away. It's decaying. And it's just a matter of time before it falls. Jesus is tired of being sick and tired. So by this world being just a moment from falling, uh, this suggests to me uh, the function of the church, the function of a believer. We have a primary function. And our primary function as the church is to operate as salt. Uh, we got to function as a retardant to decay and a preservative in this uh, uh, fallen world. Okay? So we have purpose. We have meaning. You know? But, but we must not be in isolation. Uh, let me ask you. We all have salt shakers in our possessions. Uh, you know, if not all of us, most of us. And if you have a salt shaker and it, it never be, uh, you never use it. Uh, over time, the salt begin to uh, gel to the point where it becomes hard. And, and when you go to use that salt and you turn the shaker over, nothing comes out. Why? Because it's been in isolation for so long. And sometimes that's what happens uh, with us. We be in isolation so long, we're afraid uh, to be that salt that God is calling us, that we, we, we live in fear. You know, we become numb to the situations around us. I'm not talking about in the community. I'm talking about the situations within your own heart. Sometimes you have to salt yourself. Amen? Salt um, things in your home. Okay? And the potential condition is that the salt being in isolation or not being used have lost its savior. Okay? Uh, the Greek word literally means to become foolish. But in this case, it means to lose taste, to become inert. In other words, if you don't use what God is giving you, if you don't use the salt that he's put inside of you, uh, it, it loses its capacity to do its job. Amen? So, so, so Jesus seems here to be talking about believer who lose their influence in the world. They become, or we become inert. We become tasteless. Uh, we become inoffensive. Uh, we become saltless Christians. Amen. And we are bland and we are tasteless and we add nothing. We add nothing to the community. We add nothing to the church. We add nothing to this world. We add nothing. So if we're not adding nothing, then we're doing nothing to, to the community to, to stop more decay. You know, I just believe that 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 this secular world has a bigger uh, effect on Christians than Christians have on the world. I really believe that. You know, yes, the secular world has a bigger effect on us than we as Christians have on the world. I ask you tonight. How are we different from the world when it comes to materialism? You ever thought about it? How are we different from the world when it comes to morality? When it comes to honesty? When it comes to com compassion? Or even when it comes to um, entertainment? We need to ask ourselves every day what kind of world would we live in without christian influence where would you be right now if you wasn't influenced by a christian if a christian hasn't or didn't take the time to to pray for you uh, if a Christian didn't take time to read you the word, to tell you about a loving Savior, 
where would you be? Now apply that to yourself. There are a lot of tasteless Christians in this world. And they need our support. They need our help. We need to preserve them by becoming what? Salt. Amen. Imagine how much worse condition the world would be in without the positive contribution and the restraining influence of Christianity. Are you loving God just to love God? Are you loving God just to be to yourself? Are you loving God uh, not thinking that he has given you some type of assignment? No, being a Christian requires work. The, the, harvest, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Salt has little or no effect if it's not applied to some other substance or some other material. material. Salty believers must exert their influence throughout society in order for them to be any good or do any good. In other words, we got to get out the salt shaker. Amen. We got to get out the salt shaker out of our comfort zone and do what we must do for the Lord. You need to understand that Christian isolation is not biblical. You're not on an island by yourself. You can't stay on an island by yourself. Amen. The potential problem is is this. Salt general, generally um, does not lose its saltiness. Salt generally doesn't become inert or uh, uh, lazy. You, you see what I'm going with this? It, it, it generally doesn't does that. Uh, chemically speaking, salt is salt. It doesn't break down unless it is impure or chemically changed. So it seems that Jesus is setting forth uh, an impossible condition, but he's not. This sort of language is not foreign to Jesus' teaching. You know, uh, even in Matthew, Jesus said a camel cannot go through the eye of a needle. Well, that statement is ironic or is is. That statement is, is paradoxical. In other words, it doesn't make sense uh, on the face of that statement. But that statement will hold you. It will remind you that statement is hard for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Uh, uh, it will cause you to pause. Amen. It will cause you. Call, cause you to pause. Uh, it will cause or you to look at that statement more closely. The same thing with salt. Salt loses its saltiness. It's like, what? It'll make you think about it. Amen? If it make you think about it as a hearer or reader, you should realize that as salts, citizens of the kingdom should not lose our Savior, our flavor. Amen? We can't be flavorless. We can't lose our flavor. Okay? In other words, we can't lose our influence upon this world. We got work to do. Like salt, we cannot become unsalted. And such a notion is absurd. It's ludicrous. It's crazy. Amen. You got the you must be what Christ has called you to be. Now we heard the potential problem. Now let me let me look at the potential uh, 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 result. Listen, listen, listen. If you don't use what God is giving you, you're good for nothing. All right, right. Verse thirteen: You are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its savior. Wherewith shall it be? Salted, it is thenceforth good for nothing 
but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. If you are failing to fulfill your purpose, if you are failing to live up to the responsibilities that God has given you, in all honesty, you're good for nothing. The only thing you're good for is to be cast out and trodden under the foot of mankind. It's a true fact. If salt is not good or whatever, you know what I'm saying, it's commonly thrown away. Unwanted salt will commonly be thrown onto the pathways or to the roadways. And if I can use an application, it would be this. Beware lest you lose the distinctive Christian flavor and become just like the unsaved crowd. That's what's going to happen if you don't use what God has given you. You're going to revert back to the old ways. You're going to revert back to being just a part of the godless crowd. Amen? Let me say this. Christians who are the same as, as everybody else are in a sense good for nothing and worthy of chastisement. I can't say it, no, no, no plan. If you are the same as everybody else, uh, in a sense, you are good for nothing. And you are worthy of chastisement from the Lord. Why? Because you are not being distinctive. And you have little positive influence. Don't be a Christian who just go along with the godless crowd. Don't be a Christian who never restrain from sin. The Christian church today, uh, generally speaking, has lost much of its saltiness. We don't have no flavor. That's why we can't get folk to come to church. Because we're doing the same thing the folks who don't come to church do. Okay? Many, many, many parts of Christianity, especially in the free and prosperous countries, we are so worldly that we have few distinguishing marks separating us from non-Christians. What I'm saying is, I can have a lineup. Christian, non-Christian, Christian, non-Christian, non-Christian, Christian, Christian. Would I be able to distinguish them in a lineup? No, because we as Christians are dumbing down to the world's idea. We are accepting worldly ideal. Amen. I just believe that the Western world, um, as Christians, um, is slowly fading. Uh, we don't speak up uh, like the world does. Uh, we go along with the crowd. Uh, the only time we want to pray uh, as a whole is when something bad happens. Uh, why can't we just apply our salt and say, you know what? It's a good day. Let's call for a world prayer. Let's just thank God. You know? We're losing our flavor. We're becoming flavorless. Okay? Matthew 5, 13. I love it. You are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its savior. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot by men. That's scary. <laughs> That's scary. You are the salt of the earth. Disciples such as yourself are like salt because you are precious. You need to understand that in the day of Jesus, salt was a value commodity. Roman soldiers were sometimes paid with salt. Amen? Giving a rise to that phrase, you worth your salt. Y'all remember that phrase? He worth his salt. You are the salt of the earth. 
You are disciples of Christ. Disciples are like salt because they have a, a, a preserving influence. You know what I'm saying? Uh, salt was used to preserve meats and to slow decay, as I mentioned earlier. And Christians should have a preserving influence on our community, our church, our family, wherever we go. We should have an influence on everybody. Everybody. You don't have to tell people you are a Christian. You can show them you are a Christian. Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. You are like salt because you add flavor. So Christians, we should be flavorful people. The second part, if you lose this, its flavor, then it is good for nothing. Salt must keep its saltiness to be of any value. You got to keep your saltiness. When it is no good as salt, it is trampled under the foot of man. So in the same way, too many Christians, we lose our flavor and we become good for nothing. And then you want to go put the blame on everybody but your own self. You know? You know, Revelations, let me see, Revelations 3.16. Thank you, Jesus, for that revelation. Uh, Revelations 3.16. Let me just. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Not my words. Jesus' words. In this spiritual sense, lukewarmness is a picture of indifferences. And compromise. It, 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 it tries to, 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 to play the middle. Too hot to be cold. And too cold to be hot. In trying to be both things. You end up being nothing. <laughs> Just like you know salt. If you're not salty. You end up being nothing. So here in this text. In trying to be hot and cold at the same time. You end up being nothing. Except to hear the words, I will vomit or spew you out of my mouth. Now, now Jesus is not implying that that unsalted or uh, 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 believer may lose his salvation. He's not implying that. Let's let's set the record straight. We need to understand that this is a warning, not a threat. Remember that in wisdom literature, you can't. Press the literal meaning of a word too far. You can't do that. But you got to focus on the main point of the comparison, not on every little detail. All right? A nuance. Now, but here's the main point of the comparison. Retain your gospel witness and testimony in the world. Be a good example to others. Have a impact on society. Be different, but be different in a good sense. Seek to retard moral decay and seek to be a positive influence. Why? Because you are salt. Not only that, but you are also light of the world. Hmm. If I were to ask you what is the significance of light, what would you tell me? Hmm? Significance of light, illumination. Uh, significance of light dispels the darkness. Significance of light, it shows the way, it, 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 it reveals the truth, etc. While salt has a negative function, Watch this, not in a bad way. While salt has a negative function, which is preventing decay, light has a positive function, which is showing the way. We know God is light. 1 John 1 5 tells us that. We all know that. Amen. Let's go to 1 John 1 5. Amen. 1 John 
one five. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. So, so, so we must begin our understanding of God right here. John declares this on the, the, the simple understanding that God himself is light. And light by definition has no darkness at all. You are the light of the world. For there are to be darkness, for there to be darkness, there must be an absence of light. So therefore, if there is a problem with our fellowship with God, it's our own fault. It's not the fault of God because there is no sin or darkness in God at all. So in contrast to the comparison, the world is a dark place. You know, the people of the world, they, they like darkness. They love darkness. They sit in darkness. Amen? Men love darkness rather than light because they are, their deeds are, are all about evil. Okay? And one thing we need to understand about light, light is a common symbol in the Bible. It represents purity. It represents truth. It represents knowledge. It, it represents divine revelation, and it represents God's presence. Amen? Even in the Old Testament, the Israelites thought of themselves as light in a dark world. However, the Old Testament spoke of Messiah, the Messiah, as the true light of the world. Jesus' disciples are light in the derived sense, as the moon is light but only because it reflects the light of the sun. You, you understand what I'm saying? So a light is visible. A light is obvious. A light is noticeable. It shines forth. So I ask you as light of the world, are you visible? Are you obvious? Are you noticeable? Do you shine forth? As citizens of the kingdom of God, we are the light of the world. We must be obvious. We must be visible. And we must be noticeable. There can be no such thing as a secret or a invisible Christian. Maybe that's the problem. We are secret Christians. God knows. But who else knows? <laughs> Let me read Matthew 5, 14 and 16 again. Help me, Holy Ghost. Mm. Matthew 5. Let me see. Matthew chapter 5. I said verse what? 14 and, and 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light, let your light, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in where? Heaven. You are the light of the world. You don't want to sing the song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine. You are the light of the world. Jesus gives the Christians both a great compliment and he gives us a great responsibility when he declares that we are the light of the world because he claimed that title for himself as he walked this earth. <clears throat> Jesus is giving you big props. Jesus is believing in you. Jesus is trusting you. He gave you the greatest compliment that anybody can give you. You are light. He claimed that title, but he didn't own it because he wanted to share that responsibility with you. And that's awesome to have Jesus give me that title. I am light of the world. 
and light of the world means that we are not only light receivers, but also light givers. We receive the light from Jesus Christ, but we got to give the light that he gave us. Amen? Once we become the receiver, we must become the giver. We must have a, a, a greater concern than only ourselves, and we cannot live only to ourselves. We must have someone else to shine to and do it lovingly. Understand that Jesus never challenged us to become salt or light. He never challenged us to become salt or light. He simply said that we are. We are either fulfilling or we're even failing at that given responsibility. That's all to it. Amen. Ain't no in-between. There's no in-between. The figures of salt and light should also remind us that the life marked by the Beatitudes is not to, to once again live in isolation. How can you as a Christian live in isolation? How can you not share what God has given you? We got to uh, uh, stop assuming that our inner qualities can only be developed or displayed in isolation from the world. But Jesus wants us to live them out before the world. He wants us to be on display. Jesus sets us on the highest shelf because we are precious. But we are to be illuminating what he has given us. The command, let your light so shine uh, before men, those who possess the light must transmit or, or must shine that light that God has given them, the light that God is calling you. What is a lamp in a room? Amen? What, what a lamp in the room? Disciples of Christ are to be in the world. We are to be in that room. The room of this world. Amen. As followers of Christ, we got to be uh, both visible and we got to be radiant. Believers are the light lighted. Apart from Christ, we cannot shine. You all know this. The electric light bulb. It can't emit light all by itself. The bulb only imparts light when connected and turned on so that the electric current generated in the powerhouse is transmitted to that bulb. So also as long as, as, as Christ's followers remain in living contact with the original light, which is who? Jesus Christ. Then we can, light, then we can be the light to others. Being light and salt Hear me now, being, I'm almost finished. Being light and salt will bring about good result. I'm not trying to shortchange you tonight, but I got another assignment, amen? But being light and salt will bring about good result. Why? It tells us that they may see your good works. You want people to see your good works. Amen. People see your good works. The assumption is that citizens of Jesus' kingdom should be doing good work. He doesn't specify what kind of good works other than the kind that other might observe. He also later tells us not, uh, uh, not do religious work. Things such as charity, or, or, or prayer, and fasting before men to be seen of them. No, no. One should not do good works to gain uh, a personal prestige or status. Uh, but we should do good work to, to, to express or that somebody might have a good testimony or even yourself. A Christian testimony should be plainly visible, but one's private religious duty should be done very quietly. You know, you shouldn't be standing all in the streets praying and stuff for a show. Uh, that, that, ain't, that ain't good works. I understand if you are having a prayer walk and, you know, uh, the church has come together to go out and save souls, that's differently. Uh, okay? 
do good works that God might be, be glorified. Now, this is no guarantee that unbelievers will turn to God based on your good work. But it does, to me, suggest that the believer's good work may be helpful in leading others to Christ. So when you're doing a good work, you don't see a change in an individual. <laughs> don't get all bent out of shape. You know, don't become upset. Don't think that your work is in vain. Uh, you keep watering or planting. Somebody else will come along and water it. And God will give the increase. Okay? Uh, so I pray that you uh, will be the salt and the light that God is calling uh, you to be. It's a great combination. Uh, it's a great combination. Um, I want to take you to two more scriptures. Um, Ephesians chapter 5. Amen. We're going to end. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 5. All right. Mm. Ephesians chapter 5. And we want to look at our verses 8. 5 verse 8. Verse 89. 89. Okay. <clears throat> For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness. In what? The truth. And righteousness in the truth. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness righteousness and truth finding out what is acceptable unto the lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them for it is what verse 12 a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret Verse 8 starts off, for you were once darkness. Here Paul condemned those who practice dark things, fornication, uncleanness, covet covetedness. Uh, he described them as sons and people of disobedience. He also recognized that what they was doing uh, was exact darkness uh, but as Christians now that we are light we have been emerged we have been redeemed from that darkness and having been enlightened by God himself we are to walk as children of light the theme is repeated you are children of light so live like children of light. Paul doesn't only say that we were once in darkness. He says we were once darkness itself. Ooh. Mm. Mm. That touched me. But now we are not only in the light. We are light. Where? In the Lord. Amen. Philippians 2.15 it's the next chapter over. You don't have to turn far. Amen. Got Ephesians, Philippians 2.15. Listen if you don't mind. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, among whom you shine as lights. As lights in this world. Now, now this is not an encouragement to do something. What it is, is a simple statement of fact. Christians are lights in the world. The only question is, how brightly 
do you shine. Not lights merely, but luminaries, heavenly bodies. Amen? How brightly do you shine? If we are to fulfill our place as lights in this world, think about it. Lights are used to make things evident. Lights they are used to guide. Lights, they are used as a warning. Lights, they are used to bring cheer. Lights are used to make things safe. Lights are used to show you the way. And Paul in this text knew that the lights were in a bad place. He knew that instead of excusing the lights for not shining, Paul knew that their position made it all the more important that they shine. Being in a dark place is a greater incentive to shine. You have it. God has called you light. He has given you light. So in closing, I just pray that you brighten and season the corner where you are. I just pray uh, that you will be the preservative uh, that God has called you to be. And I pray that as a Christian, as a child of God, uh, that you do not become flavorless. Let's commit ourselves to being salt and light within our church, uh, within our community. Uh, as salt, we want to be a force against moral decay and a source of flavor to our world. And as light, we want to shine forth brightly uh, in a dark world with the gospel message and with a positive Christian testimony. I want to thank you uh, tonight uh, for watching. Um, I pray that this, this lesson has compelled you uh, to be about your father's business. I pray that this lesson has really caused you to look deeply within yourself. Uh, are you doing the works of Jesus Christ? Are you being the salt? Are you being the light that he so greatly asked you to be? Uh, I just want to thank you for tuning in tonight and let us continue to pray for one another. Let us continue to, to pray for this great branch of Zion, a Mount Olive Baptist Church, and let us be what God has called us to be. Uh, we both can be salt. We both can be the light uh, that we can cause this world uh, to, to, to progress uh, with the works of Jesus Christ. Uh, I pray that you have a wonderful night. And until we meet again, uh, I pray that the God uh, above will bless you tremendously in all of your ways. Uh, let us pray. Uh, precious Father, we thank you for this study tonight, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for revealing the truth. And sometimes, Father, the truth hurts. You know what I'm saying? But we know that the truth can make us better Christians, Lord God. It's time we stop being in isolation, Lord God. It's time that we shine uh, brightly uh, for you and this wayward world, Lord God. Help us to save souls, Lord God, starting in, 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 in to deal with our families, Lord God. Help us reach out to those who uh, have no idea uh, about you, Lord God, uh, that we might make this world a better place. Uh, once again, Heavenly Father, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise because we know that you are worthy, Lord God. We thank you for your teachings. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you for your instructions on teaching us how to live, that we might be impactful, Lord God, upon this earth. Now bless us, we shall be blessed. Keep us, we shall be kept. Love us and we shall be loved. In Christ's name we pray. And the treasure of God said, Amen, Amen. And I pray you go in peace and may the Lord God bless you real good.